Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first redistricting workshop. This is our redistricting process. It's four years ago, or five years ago now, we went through our districting process. And that's where we first, we created our first districts here in the city, and we have six districts and a mayor elected at large. Uh, but now, after the 2020 census, every a city is required to do a redistricting process. And so that's what we're going through now. Today we have with us Dr. Levitt with National Demographics Corporation, and he'll be uh, leading and guiding this uh, workshop today. Um, be creative. Think outside the lines. You're allowed to color outside the lines. <laughs> and so. And we appreciate any and all input. You can draw maps, you can bring them to the city clerk's office, you can send them in online. Um, there's going to be mapping tools, online mapping tools, which are really quite interesting. I did that this week, um, how you can play with the numbers and ship the districts around. So have fun with it, and please submit anything and everything that, that you like. All right, and Dr. Levitt, thank you. Um, we're getting started right at 10 to make sure, because one of the new laws actually that we're dealing with guiding this redistricting is called the Fair Maps Act, and it has a whole bunch of new procedural requirements, including starting as close to the start time you are supposed to as possible. Brenda's pretty much said my introduction. Redistricting is required once every 10 years following the census. Um, so even though the city only went to districts a few years ago, Following the 2020 census, we're required to take another look at our districts and see whether or not they still comply with those federal and state requirements. Um, and it's also an opportunity for the city to look at those lines and see if, if and what needs to change. Uh, and so, you know, unfortunately for us, the really, the biggest challenge in the process is just the delay in getting started. And it's not the city's fault. I want to be very you know, clear. Everyone got started late this year because the census itself was delayed. Normally, we would expect to get census data in March. This year, the initial state census data release was in August, nearly five months after it generally comes out. In addition, for the first time, the state is looking at or has completed a prisoner realignment where basically where prisoners are counted has been reallocated from the blocks, from the prisons to the blocks of their last known addresses. Um, this data set didn't actually come out until September 20th. And so that's really when this process got underway here in California. And for, you know, we have until April to complete this. So the counties and the state itself have until December. Um, the state gave itself a couple more weeks to complete it, but the counties, including Orange County, have to be done by December 15th. But for the city, um, we kicked things off earlier in this year where we kind of gave the city council an update on the process in, back in August, um, and we had a public hearing on October 19th. And then we're doing this community workshop today, and following this community workshop, November 16th, our plan is to start the process of actually looking at some draft maps. Now, that really just kicks off the second stage of the process. So I don't want anyone to feel that if you don't get something done by November 15th, that you're out of the game, because that's really only the beginning of looking at the maps. Over the next three months, um, in December 1st and January 8th, we're gonna have another set of community workshops where we're going to look at those draft maps and maybe even some new ones. Maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe you'll come up with some new ideas in between that. Looking at those maps and saying, hey, that really doesn't work, or you know, what if we tweaked here? And coming up with some new ideas, that will all go back to the council on February 15th. Um, and our deadline of April 17th gives us some flexibility. If the council needs more time, if the council needs to more deliberation, we have some time built into the schedule. Not as much as we would have if we had gotten the data five months earlier, but that's life. Um, what point is I want to make is that this is just sort of the initial stages. We're looking, we're still in the portion where we're looking for communities of interest. We're looking for what works and what doesn't work about the current boundaries. Looking toward what can and needs to change for the next 10 years because these district lines that are adopted by the council in 2022, 
they're going to be used for the next 10, ele- next 10 years, the next five elections. And the next time the city will get the chance to look at these district boundaries again will be in 2031. And hopefully at that point we'll get the census um, on time and plenty of time to look at all of this in uh, a series of workshops over the summer. Um, so when I say the law has changed, what has changed from the districting process? And for our purposes, especially here today, one of the biggest changes is in the rules. So federal law hasn't really changed much, and that's the sort of the column on the left, federal laws. Um, districts have to be equal in terms of the total number of residents. Um, this is what we're waiting for that census data to determine. Now, this, you don't have to get to perfect equality. Like, you don't have to make sure each district is the exact same number of people. You are allowed to what we call deviate or have a little bit of a difference. But that difference can be no more than a 10% overall difference between the largest and smallest districts. That's the 10% deviation. If you're above 10%, then that plan is constitutionally, and we're talking about the federal constitution here, unacceptable. So we need to get that percentage below 10%. And as we're going to see, Costa Mesa's districts currently are above that 10% barrier, so they will need to change somewhat. We also need to consider the Federal Voting Rights Act. While race cannot be the only factor or even the predominant factor in the creation of a district, or um, you know, it has to be one of many factors, protected class communities, groups that have historically faced discrimination or barriers to registration and voting, have their rights protected under the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, and so we have to balance this as we look forward through the rest of the criteria on the slide. What has really changed is this middle column. It used to be the case that we used to take a lot of things into balance with each other. Now the set has, state has set a rank-ordered priority among these criteria. So first, we have to take into account contiguity. Contiguity is the idea that a district should be one whole piece without any little islands or unconnected bits. So we can't have a little bit right here at the south end of the city connected all the way to, or not connected, but have another little bit of a district up by South Coast Plaza. That would be a non-contiguous district. Then districts have to represent communities and neighborhoods and, and um, other sorts of socioeconomic geographic areas that should be kept together for the purpose of effective and fair representation. And that's a line taken right out of the law. We're going to come back to communities of interest in a second. But in general, we want to think about communities of interest as areas with shared concerns, shared problems, shared issues, um, things that bring a neighborhood together, particularly with respect to city governance. And so things might be a community of interest when we're dealing with the county or school district or the state, but not necessarily the city. And so we want to think about those kinds of issues and cultural, political issues that bring neighborhoods together. Uh, Third, easily identifiable boundaries. This is the principle that districts should be easy for residents to understand. So to the extent that we can follow major roads, canals, um, other sorts of natural and man-made boundaries that might really serve to divide communities so that voters can understand, hey, if you live west of this park, you're in District 1, and if you're in east of this park, you're in District 2. That's the sort of ease that we're talking about. If we have to jog through a neighborhood where voters on, with odd addresses on a street are in one district and even addresses on the same street are in another, we probably are not following the most easily identifiable boundary. And finally, compactness. The law defines compactness as not bypassing one group of people to get a more distant group of people. So this is aimed at fingers or hooks or odd things, often designed to you know, get a particular census block, um, be maybe because a challenger or an incumbent lives there. Um, districts should make sense is generally the overall theme in these four criteria. But they are rank ordered, and that rank order is important. If we have a community that naturally doesn't have the most compact boundary or doesn't easily or cleanly follow a boundary, we have to keep the community together first 
And then we look at easily identifiable boundaries or compactness. So just because it follows a major road doesn't mean that it's necessarily better if the community defines itself or has a, you know, can be defined as encompassing both sides of that road. Um, and this is something that's new and we're still working out as we look through actual real world cities and real world data. Um, where do we see these community boundaries? Where do they conflict with easily identifiable boundaries? And this is something that we're really asking everyone to help out with because you know the city you know, intimately because you live here. Um, and finally, the Fair Maps Act also explicitly prohibits discriminating or favoring a political party. Uh, you'll note that basically nonpartisan elections in California, or local elections in California are nonpartisan. Sorry, it's an early morning. Um, and I mean, I had a city council meeting that went to 1130 last night, so, you know, and that was on a Friday. So um, it's a little early for me, but um, essentially local elections are nonpartisan here in California. And so partisanship is not something we include in our database because it's explicitly prohibited by law. In fact, even if people bring it up, the council can't discuss it as part of their deliberation on it. They have to ignore testimony that focuses on partisanship. And finally, other traditional districting principles. These are factors that once you've taken into account all of the Fair Maps Act criteria and all of the federal criteria can serve as that kind of final balance or final check. If we have two plans that we think are equally good, we can use some of these traditional principles that courts have recognized over the years as being valid considerations to select that final map. And that includes factors like minimizing the number of voters shifting election years. So that if somebody last had an election for council in 2018, their next election is in 2022, not in 2024. Um, or respecting the voters' choices, the principle that voters of the city have elected a council and that it should be up to the voters to decide whether or not the council members continue or not up to the stroke of a pen and where we place the district boundary. And future population growth, if we know that there's new development coming up, then we can take that into account with that equal population criterion. We can't exceed that 10%, but we can underpopulate that area, that district. That includes that area where we know there's massive projects coming online over the next decade. So these are some things we can take into account once we've looked through the federal and state criteria in that order and using these other principles as kind of a last final check when we're comparing two equally good maps. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about communities of interest because communities of interest is really the central piece of any district map because it's what we really care about. Do the districts represent our neighborhoods, our communities well? And so what are neighborhoods? Well. At the smallest level, we can think of neighborhoods as being the building blocks of those districts. Down to the single apartment buildings, condominium complexes, subdivisions, homeowners associations. Um, maybe they're areas that are defined by the state or by the city, such as a historical district, a specific plan area, a special tax area, sorry. Um, they could also be defined by the school or parks or other community facilities that make up the city. So areas impacted by a particular, you know, um, by a particular, you know, commercial development, by a particular school and the issues that they deal with concerning traffic and road crossings and all of that and how it interfaces with the, you know, city. And also culture and, cultural and historical landmarks are a part of communities of interest as well. Um, so where are the churches and the synagogues and the other community centers, whether it's community centers that are run by the state or the city like this one, or community centers that are more informal or run by a private organization, but serve as a gathering point for members of a specific community. And this, when we talk about neighborhoods, we're really focused on the geography. So to the extent that we, ha we can, we want to know where it is on the map. And it doesn't matter whether or not it's going to, you know, 
for this purpose, it doesn't matter whether it's too small or too big, we just want to know where it is. And, we'll, you know, because we have to take that into account as we're looking at redrawing the map. Um, and so if we have a vague understanding, that's great. But if we have a more specific one, like for example, we know that, hey, this neighborhood is really between, you know, Bristol Street and Harbor, you know, and this corridor, hey, that's what we really want to know. And communities of interest really take that concept of neighborhood and broaden it to bring in factors like demographics, apartment owners versus single family homes, multi, or, sorry, multi-family versus single family, um, homeowners versus renters, um, where people of different income levels, education levels, and so on live throughout the city. So I think of this as sort of, it's trying to bring a richness to that communities of interest story by showing that it's not, you know, more than just, you know, not just numbers on one hand, also not, you know, it, it, because we also have to really understand and look at where the community itself defines that neighborhood. And really one of the questions here is, how do, is it a community of interest for the city? That's really what the second question is getting at. Because you can have different, you know, the city of Costa Mesa might have some differences that really are important for city government and the way that neighborhoods interact with the city that are less relevant to other levels of government and vice versa because of how federal, state, and county and other levels of government interact. I'll give an example. Attendance areas are very important to school districts when they redistrict. They might be less important at city redistricting because you know, the school board and the city council really don't have much to do with each other in terms of that formal relationship. Yeah, there's gonna be some engagement, but it's not gonna be the same priority as it will be for the school district. And so when this, we'll ask, we ask a second question, what needs to be included for, especially for city government in one district for the purpose of its effective and fair representation? And so when we're thinking about this, think about the ways that you engage with the city whether it's the services you use, the neighborhood you live in, um, you know, all the different ways that the city plays a role um, in, in, well, in your quality of life. I mentioned earlier that the districts are not uh, balanced in terms of total population. I kind of want to talk about that here. Overall, with the 2020 adjusted census numbers, the current district map has an 11.5% deviation. That means that it's over that 10% threshold. Um, so that means that we're going to need to see some of the districts redrawn. Uh, we do see that two of the districts, districts one and two, are both overpopulated um, by 5% and 4% respectively. And districts three and four are underpopulated by five and six and a half percent respectively. So we, this is kind of driving this, while five and, and also five and six are both about equal at 1% deviation for five, one and a half percent for five, and about a half percent deviation for six. Um, this doesn't mean that those districts can't change. If there are things that don't work, and we've already heard some, particularly um, you know, from the residents of district six around the Golden Triangle, the south end of the city, um, then those districts may change as well. Um, what we do know is that some of these districts will have to adjust their population in order to become population balanced. And so where do we draw these lines? Where do we shift things around to at least balance the populations first? Um, looking at the Voting Rights Act analysis, there is one majority Latino district. Um, and here we're looking at the second block, the citizen voting age population. That's the population over 18 with U.S. citizenship. And the courts like to call this the eligible voter count um, because they're sort of a nice way of thinking about it. Citizens of voting age are people who are eligible to register to vote. Uh, while the Voting Rights Act doesn't guarantee an election, it does guarantee an opportunity to elect um, if you can draw a majority district. And in this case, we have a 57% Latino district in, in District 4. Um, looking at the at the color thematic of percent Latino, we kind of see how District 4 encapsulates the core of that community. Um, the areas that are in the brighter colors, the pinks, the yellows, are majority Latino. 
the areas that are in the blues are under 25% Latino. And we have similar patterns when it comes to looking at Asian Americans, for example. Uh, we see that District 2, there are some blocks that range from about 15% up to about 30% Asian American, um, although most of the rest of the city is under 15% is under Asian American. Um, I mentioned we're looking at some of the demographic data. Uh, a couple of things that we've already mapped and looked at are things like multifamily housing using the same color schemes. So areas in pink and yellow, a majority of the housing in those areas is multifamily. So apartments, condominiums, townhomes, anything that's structured with more than a one unit. The areas in the blues and um, the purples are under 25% multifamily housing. Uh, we've also looked at education. Um, I think this is one of these interesting ones because education does not correlate perfectly in Costa Mesa with um, multifamily housing. In fact, in the north end of the city, there's a lot of multifamily housing that also is very high levels of education. Um, and so we have some interesting demographics here, but of course the numbers only tell part of that story. And where we want to look at today and throughout this first and continuing throughout the process is how these numbers actually translate into good district boundaries for the city. And so to help this, uh, we've put together a package of tools. And I want to start by saying that we want your feedback however you want to give it. You know, if you want to just say something for the record today, because we're going to be recording here, then we'll bring the microphone around later and you can just uh, say it right into the camera so we have a record of it. If you want to leave a comment, we've got comment cards. So if you don't have to, you know, don't have to draw anything, you can just write in what you want to say. We also have on the website contact form and email address where you can email your comments into the city. And we've already gotten a couple of maps. So I think at least one map has already come in that way. Um, and for those of you who want to go a little bit further, uh, we do have some tools here today that we're going to encourage you. We're going to take a break in a few minutes to let you use and engage with. Uh, the first one is very simply, um, it's a one-page kit is what we call it. It's kind of this map that you're seeing on your tables in front of you. Each of these areas has that total population count for that area. So, for example, right up in the top northwestern corner of the city where it says Whittier Law School, there's an area that has 28 people in it. That's the total population according to that census adjusted count for that area. If you want to assign it to a district, you know, if you're, and you're working here later today, we've put out some highlighters and some pens. All you've got to do is color it in and, you know, we can assign that area to a district. You can, you can um, just do it by the boundaries or you can actually color it in area by area. And I, we've literally seen people get out their phones or, you know, to get the calculator app on their phones as they start adding up the populations until they reach the ideal number. We've put the current district boundaries on there, but you don't have to follow them. If you don't think that they work, we encourage you to create your map however you think it should be divided. Um, also, on this map, we have the total population you're looking for. So 18,690, right at the bottom of this um, worksheet, um, is your ideal population. So each district should stay pretty close to that. Now, let's say there's a boundary that you want to use that isn't on here. Draw it in. You know, we can work with whatever you provide us. So if you want to, if you think that, well, hey, they haven't drawn a boundary line here, but we, I think that's a really key boundary for defining this community. Put it in there and then describe it. There's lots of blank space around here for you to describe what you're doing in your maps. And I'd encourage you to make notes about why, what you're doing and the, why you support the map that you turn in so that the council knows what kinds of communities of interest you're trying to capture. Um, and by the way, we have this available in both English and Spanish um, so that you can do it in the language of your choice. And if you need a colored reference guide, we also have maps showing the current district so that you can actually, if you don't want to color it in, 
you just want to make changes using the existing district maps, you can draw right on this map and say, hey, I want to take District 1 down to this particular line or whatever it is that you want to do. We will draw in everything we receive on this line drawing tool or, or this, this um, paper map. And if you're not ready to do it today, fine. Take it home with you. Um, this is also available on the website. Um, if I had web access, I would pull it up, but um, it's on the city's website. You can download this and draw it on your own time. You can even color it in and paint. I think we had somebody do that um, and submit that. Or what a lot of people are doing nowadays is coloring it in, taking a picture of it with their phone, and emailing that picture into the city. We're happy to take it however you want to do it. If you want to drop it off at City Hall, we'll make sure it gets to us. And if you want to email it to us, we'll take it that way as well. I think we even have um, a you know contact information where you can get a fax number if you want to fax it to us. So uh, we'll take it any way we get it. And for those of you who are worried about your math skills, we have a version of this tool um, that comes with an Excel kit. And let me show that to you. Um, I'm going to pull that up here. So basically, we have the same version of the map, except instead of those total population counts, they're just numbered from 1 at the northwest corner of the city all the way down to about 122 in the southeast corner of the city. And we have this Excel sheet that has the populations and some of the data attached to it. And if, you're, if you know how to use Excel, you just open this up, turn off protected view, and then you can start typing in the yellow columns to assign these to districts. So I'm just going to do a couple. I'm going to assign you know, some units to different districts. And then if I look at the balance tab, it starts calculating all of this for me. And I can track all of my information on my, at least the basic dem demographics of the districts on here as well. Um, so this is, you know, really simple to use. You just look for the number, look for like number one, for example. I want to assign that to district one. So I just come to the spreadsheet and I go to the assignments tab and put that into district one. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see what I'm doing. You just put a just number one in here, and now I've assigned population unit one to district one. That automatically adds those 28 people to my district one total. Um, so if you're comfortable with Excel and you have access to the internet, this is a great way to kind of take it to the next level. There's also a web viewer where you can see the map if you don't like the PDF. There's a, there's a viewer where you can see this map online so, um, through an interactive viewer that lets you zoom in, search for addresses, pan, or move the, move the map around, um, and really get that street level detail. And again, if you need to divide a census area or a population unit area, just put into the comments, and this is why we have these submitters' comments here, tell me. I would like to divide this area because, you know, along this boundary, because I think this community, you know, name the community, is really divided along that area. So these tools, um, including, you know, the, you know, everything from leave a comment to the paper tool to the Excel tool, these are what's available right now. Over the course of the next couple of weeks, we're going to be adding an additional tool um, that really is kind of a more advanced tool. Um, a couple options that are more advanced. These are both web-based, so you will need a computer browser to use them. In fact, District R in particular, you'll need a recent browser, so you can't really, it's not really backwards compatible. District R is developed by Tufts University, um, by actually their geographic modeling department. Um, it's kind of a new tool for 2021. Um, and what it does is it lets you paint your communities of interest. Now, it's really easy to use. You basically, um, go to, when you're on District R, you basically go to select an area. You pick how big of a circle you want to include, whether it's just a small, tiny dot, so one census block, or a larger circle that might get more than one census block at a time. And then you start painting. 
the city. What I really like about District R is that it allows you to assign an area to more than one um, community of interest. So as a line drawing tool, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit harder to use, but as a community of interest drawing tool, it really is perfect because you can say that this block or this shopping center belongs to two, three, or more communities of interest. You know, let us do the hard work of trying to figure out how that translates into districts, you know, and the population numbers and all the balancing. Just tell us, this is the community that I care about. And maybe even, you know, what we're seeing in, for example, in Anaheim, is people will do a large community, and then they'll do smaller communities within that large community. Um, and so, for example, they have a very large historic district, and then they have smaller neighborhood associations within that historic district. District R lets you capture that. And then the online redistricting tool from Caliper, the Maptitude Online Redistricting, this is the most powerful of the tools that we're going to have available. It's partly why it's taking so much time to get it up and running because it has web server space that we need, that we're, you know, that the company is needing to get the bandwidth in order to run it properly. Um, now, this is a version of the same software that I use when I draw districts for a client. Um, and so it really has a lot of functionality, a lot of capacity. You do have to make a decision though. You can't assign a census block here to more than one district. You have to make a choice about where you, where you put it. But for those of you who are you know, more comfortable using a web browser this is, and, and, and or using software, this is probably the most um, technically demanding, but also the most powerful option. And what we'll see is that people who learn how to use this often don't just draw one map. They might draw two or three or four because once they start playing with it, they can't stop. And if you do that, you know, that's great. We'll take all of them and draw them all in. We may ask you which one is your preferred map and why. Uh, especially if you're drawing three or four maps where you're just moving around a census block or two. Um, we often see people submit four maps and they've only moved two blocks, but they just want to show all four combinations of what if they did everything. And um, ultimately, we're going to ask you to pick one. Which one is your favorite if you do that? But um, it is a really great way to um, delve into the data at a really deep level. Um, and if you want to spend the time to learn it, I think it pays off. I think you'll, you know, you'll, you'll be very happy with the power of the tool. Um, this one um, natively comes in six languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Chinese, and Korean. Um, this is a bit different. Um, the District R tool is natively in English only, although it can be automatically translated using, um, there's a feature where it'll automatically translate it for you. It's not the best, but this is what Tufts provides. Um, of course, Tufts doesn't really, you know, is not in California. They're not really compliant with California's uh, standards here. Um, so this is why we offer multiple options in multiple languages to try to capture uh, feedback from different groups, different communities, however you want to provide it. Um, and if you have a different way you want to provide your feedback, we're definitely open to listening. Uh, so email us so we can work with other kinds of files as well. If you're playing around with, I know we mentioned some of these, representable.org, draw my, draw my CA community. Um, draw my CA community is the state's redistricting tool. It's really designed for the state redistricting commission, but there are some people that really want to use it because they've taken the time to learn how the state's tool works. If you have it on there, we'll take it. You'll just have to take a screenshot of it and send it to us. Um, you can also, you know, there's other programs out there, Dave's redistricting, and I'm happy to give you some ideas of some other options that are out there online now. Um, although some of them are limited either in terms of the data they provide or the support that they have. Um, so, and again, I'll just apologize. It really is the census delay that's taking everyone so long. Um, normally we would have five or six months of a ramp up to get all of these tools online. And instead we're trying to push to do it in four weeks. And that's where the delay is coming from. Um, I'll just give you kind of overall numbers. There's over 400 cities across, this, across the country 
that are using online redistricting tools, which is up from about 100 that used it 10 years ago. And of those 400 cities, 200 of them are in California or thereabouts. And so really the California data delay meant that everyone just got slammed in the last month. Um, all of the internet service providers, all the web hosting, all of that. Um, and it's not just Anaheim, or it's not just Costa Mesa, it's Anaheim, it's Orange, it's Tustin, it's everywhere else that's been looking for tools. Um, they're all finding it the same barriers. Um, and so today, what, and so now, kind of moving forward, uh, we do want to give you some time to work for, with, the, with the kits, with the uh, maps that we do have here today. But before we do that, I want to open it up and see if there are, first of all, any questions about the presentation. And I think we're going to have the mic around so that we can capture your questions uh, for the recording. Thank you for all the materials that you've given us and that just the summary. Can you explain, because we're putting in some time in this, what is, on your end, the process of sorting through all of our ideas, and are they just going to be, you know, how, how do you determine if, if our ideas are, are valid, and how does that get to the city council? That's one question. The other one is, on, you said number two, the, the center column is really the most important. On the number two and two is, are the undivided neighborhoods and communities of interest, is that in a law? Is that in a government code? I think it's very, my opinion is it's very divisive, particularly in Costa Mesa, where I don't want to divide up our communities, but is that a law? So, great questions. Um, and to start off with the, the first one, the way the process works is that we will process all of the maps, whether it's a single district map all the way up to a full city map, um, and provide all that information, all those maps, to the city council. So whatever we receive, the city council will also see. Now, what we try to do, especially if we get a lot of maps, is first of all, we're going to produce some kind of summary table. And the summary table will talk about the and I'll just go back here, the, the, the basic criteria. So, for example, we will give the population deviation of each of the maps. And if it exceeds 10%, then our recommendation is that council should not consider it. Um, if it does not have a majority Latino district, I think our recommendation would have to be that it was not, would not be considered. Um, if it's not contiguous, so moving into the middle of section, we would have to recommend that council not consider it. And I phrase it like that as recommendations because if council doesn't, council may say, we, don't, we know we can't adopt this map, but we really like some things about it. And so can you draw this part of that map into a different proposal? And so it's a recommendation. Council will then take that recommendation and run with it. Um, in terms of communities of interest, this is where it's really the most, the biggest question. What is a community of interest? Because in every city, in every school district, in every county, in every, you know, in the, in every time the state goes through this, communities differ. You know, um, in 20 years ago, in 2001, um, the state legislature found that the Asian communities in the San Gabriel Valley were not a community of interest and divided them up between four districts. 10 years later, in 2011, they decided, actually, now these are a community of interest and we need to keep them together. And the problem with communities of interest that the law has traditionally had with communities of interest is that they differ depending on who you talk to, who's coming forward with ideas, how different people understand the place that they live. Now, the Fair Maps Act does give us a partial definition or they give us a definition in the law. Their areas, their socioeconomic geographic areas that would benefit from being included in a single district for the purpose of their effective and fair representation. So what are the key points of that? Well, effective and fair representation. So what this means is that, um, that if, and if, if an area needs to be 
is, you know, is not being effectively represented and they would benefit from being kept together in order to ensure that they were represented, then we have to try to keep them together. But that doesn't help us get to what that area is. And the law says socioeconomic or demographic or geographic similarity, but then the guidance on the law that comes from the people who wrote the law, so the common cause guide to the law, says just having socioeconomic similarity does not necessarily mean you have a community of interest, and just because you have a heterogeneous or diverse community doesn't mean that it's not a community of interest. So how do we make sense of that? Well, the best way that we've found is to go to you. Ask the community. Ask the people who live in the city what the communities of interest are. And we'll take all of it to the city council. Whatever we hear, whether it's one person who shows up randomly at a meeting um, to an organized group that has put together a long 30-page well-thought-out proposal. Um, because one is not necessarily more indicative than the other. And we, we put it all together and we compile it as part of this record that we, we create for the city council. And here's what people have identified as potential communities of interest. Uh, and by the way, sometimes people create non-population balanced maps that they know are not population balanced because they think it does capture communities of interest better. And what we can do as your demographers is say, well, we're really seeing that people think that these areas are linked. Now, we can't put them all together because that would create an overall district that's too big. But here's some ways we can maybe look at combining those two areas, um, capturing the cores of those two communities. Um, and so our drafts, the NDC drafts that we add to the proposal, include looking at all of that communities of interest testimony and trying different ways of putting it together. Because ultimately, I can tell you, there's going to be different ways that you can combine communities of interest. Um, in fact, I was up in Fresno earlier this week, and we had as many people saying that two areas were a community as there were saying that those areas were not a community. How do we deal with that? How does the board deal with that? How does the council deal with that? Um, that is one of the big questions, I think, and, that, and I say that you know, the, the Fair Maps Act is new. The Supreme Court has been wrestling with communities of interest since 1993 when they decided that communities of interest was something that needed to be considered in redistricting. And their definition is vaguer than the state's definition. And it's just areas that share a common interest. Um, but, you know, our hope is that what we can see is that as we have this conversation, as we have the maps, as we have the discussion, we come to, if not a consensus, at least an understanding of what different parts of the city see as their communities of interest, um, particularly from the residents of the city and the people who live in those different parts of the community. And I'll just add one more thing. When we present the maps, if we get a lot of maps, we're going to group them by those similarities. So we're going to say, hey, these are four maps that are all tried to you know, keep District X the same, or these are four maps that create um, a new district in this part of the city. That's how we kind of reduce it for the community and for the council. And then say, if you like that idea of creating that new district in that area, pick one of them to continue as your focus map. Because what you'll see is that there's only a limited number of real practical ways people will divide up the city and that a lot of the more random proposals well, just won't go anywhere. The council and the community will say, we don't want concentric circles. I say, you know, we don't want uh, stripes across the city. So here are, the, here are the five or six, maybe if that, maybe three or four ways that it actually makes sense to draw the map. And we'll put those maps into those groups for the council. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was really thorough. Um, so I have just like two clarifying questions. So one is, I was in a redistricting meeting not for the city of Costa Mesa and the commissioners were very explicit that they were looking for um, a map to adopt by a, a resident. Like that, that wanted, they wanted a submitted map. 
I just want to clarify that you are not necessarily looking to adopt a, a residence map, but you were looking to kind of aggregate residence ideas into a map that can be approved by council. Is that is that right? So we would be we would love it if the if the council adopts a community drawn map. So I don't want to rule that out because in many cases the NDC drafts that we produce add to the conversation. In many cases, what they're trying to do is take into account comments that we've heard that are submitted by people who haven't drawn a full map proposal. And in some cases, um, it's sort of a back and forth process of different options being revised, being improved. And I could certainly see a situation and have in the past where we start with the community map, but we have to make modifications. Because, um, for example, the community map didn't really pay much attention to the division line between districts five and six. And so the residents of both of those areas came out and said, what the heck are you doing in my neighborhood? And we have to clean that up. Um, so I would say that we love it when the council adopts a community-based map. Um, but I'll say that a lot of the initial draft maps are not gonna be the final map adopted because inevitably, there will be revisions, and that's part of why we have the different um, public hearings, to look at changes as we move forward. Thank you. My second question is, I, I just want to also clarify what you said earlier, is that um, although these are uh, kind of apportioned by census districts or census tracts at the moment, um, you are totally okay with us dividing those census tracts for the sake of uh, drawing a map. But did I understand that right? So. Um, so these population units on the map are, yes, you can divide them. Now, we, we are trying to follow census blocks, okay. which are smaller. And a, you can think of a census block as literally being a city block. Um, and so if there is an issue where you're dividing a census block, we'll reach out to you if you put your contact information there and say, hey, your map divides this. Would this be an acceptable way of drawing it in? Um, because we want to help you get a map that works. Um, and, you know, we have the time, at least with the paper maps and all that, to, um, you know, understand where those block boundaries are. If, if we do need to divide a block, that has to be at the direction of the city council. I concur. Thank you for your presentation. It's very clear. Um, I think with regard to the communities of interest, it has possibly something to do with scaling of the city, too. Costa Mesa is a small city, and our communities do consider themselves as one, I believe. Uh, so it's harder. We have neighborhoods, but we are one city. Uh, whereas in Anaheim, as you described, there are many, many neighborhoods, so it's different. But um, I have two questions regarding the demographics and how we use the numbers. Um, first of all, daytime residences and how we, our city is impacted by daytime residences, both with business and schools, uh, especially colleges. Is there an opportunity to consider the differences that come to our neighborhoods based on daytime residents only, um, and how do we interpret that? And then I have a second question about how the state uses the demographic numbers to qualify areas for grants. Sure. Um, the, so for the official 10% number, we are using the census count, whatever that is. However, as far as both communities of interest and for that additional balancing that we can do at the very end, um, we can certainly take that into account areas that are impacted by you know, a large number of daytime residents are often communities of interest for other reasons as well. Um, the area around a college or university can be a community of interest, and certainly in many places from city of Redlands to Claremont to you know, elsewhere, those are part of their discussion of communities of interest. Um, in fact, I, I know of one district that has a UC in it where they have to have a discussion about how do we not draw an entire city council district on campus where we don't have people living for more than four years <laughs> because otherwise nobody will be eligible to run <laughs> for city council. Um, so those are the kinds of questions that, of course, go into communities of interest and areas that are impacted and those impacts on traffic, on businesses, on, you know, are part of this discussion. And they go right to this, and I'll just, sorry for keep going back, but I wanna point out, they go right to the second part question about fair and effective representation. Because on one hand, there might be a trade-off here. 
that um, the impacts of that are disproportionately felt in a community. So we might say that that neighborhood needs to be kept together for their effective and fair representation. So they have a council member that's an advocate for the actual nighttime residents who are more who are impacted in their daily life by the traffic, by the noise, by the events, by the other things that are going on. Thank you. Um, so secondly, in having been a government employee and, and applying for grants, you're often, you always have to look at the state demographics and figure out whether or not you qualify within those. Um, is there any guidance you can give us when we're looking at redistricting as to how we might um, move the districts <laughs> to augment our uh, our el eligibility for the for those funds? Because right now we have we have a good deal of open space in districts four and five that impact um, how we can apply for grants for the city. Yeah, I mean, and again, I, I, I go right back to the second question. Um, sometimes we hear from areas, particularly like downtowns or. Um, in one case, it's the area that's the fire zone because their city abuts one of those wildfire corridors. Um, that they needed to divide it to make sure that there were more than one council member representing in the area because they really needed to present a unified front with more than one representative advocating on behalf of the city. Um, and so um, this, this comes up with downtown LA, for example, um, is debating this right now. Um, does, does a neighborhood benefit from having more than one representative when we're not just talking about the people, but we're talking about the issues relating to something like wildfire abatement, where the city has to deal with the state or the county or other levels of government? And that's certainly something that we might think about maybe if the most effective representation for that area is to, be, to have two representatives who can advocate on behalf of the city to make sure that it's a priority, then that might be something we want to consider, the council might consider as well. Um, particularly when it's an area where the city is dealing with these grants, either federal, state, county, or engaging with the school district. I, I would say that issue comes up all the time with school districts because they're, you know, the way that attendance areas create areas that either qualify or don't qualify for certain grants is always a consideration that they're dealing with. Uh, I just wanted to start off by thanking you, Brenda, Justin, and your whole team. Um, I'm here today on behalf of the Costa Mesa Democratic Club, and I think it's worth noting that the city is out in front of this process, is here today being very public, transparent about the redistricting process. We're not seeing that same transparency from the Newport Mesa Unified School District Board or the Mesa Water District Board. So I appreciate that the city's setting a model for that. Um, I've heard this mentioned loosely before, so I did want to take an opportunity to ask you, um, Dr. Levitt, as the expert in the room today, um, when we look at the demographic breakdown of Costa Mesa districts as they're currently drawn, and you look at District 4 with the percentage of Latino residents, um, it, it's it's definitely a political reality in Costa Mesa that there is a community that has been historically underrepresented in politics here, despite making up a large percentage of the city's population. And fortunately, you know, that's been, that's started to be changed recently in a really positive direction. But I wanted to ask you for your assessment, when you look at district four today, is that a packed district? So I, I guess I'll answer it on two levels. The first is um, I have not done an analysis of that. Um, specifically because that requires a voting rights analysis. But I can tell you it was one of the issues that was raised in the demand letter that led to the city switching to districts elections in the first place. Um, one of the challenges we see with Latino districts throughout the state is that uh, it's translating that, that total population into actual performing districts. Um, and there's a really complicated question of how that happens. Uh, we can see that if we look at the total population, District 4 is 77% Latino. But just going from total population to eligible voters or citizen voting age population, it drops to 57%. Um, you know, I don't have the full demographics on this slide, but you can see that it drops further when we look at registration and voting, particularly turnout in an off-cycle midterm election. 
So when we talk about packing, you know, one of the questions is not just total population, because as Texas has shown, it's very easy to draw a majority Latino district. It's much harder to draw an effective Latino district. And the Voting Rights Act, especially Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, really talks about the need for effective representation. And so the real issue, the real question is, if you were to divide up the Latino community in a way that perhaps lowered the Latino eligible voting population in four and added it to another district, would that create a district that couldn't perform, wouldn't perform, wouldn't be an effective district for the current district four community? And that's where we look at, you know, we don't have, we don't have the best information about registration, uh, sorry, uh, about registration by, um, sorry, I don't know what this weird note. Um, we don't have the information because people are not asked and shouldn't be asked, what race are you, what ethnicity are you when you register to vote? The state and the courts have used surname data, which is a very imprecise uh, substitute. Um, but we do see, or we do see that there is a drop off continually as you go from total population down to actual turnout. And so our, you know, the concern would be that, you know, not if, you know, not about just the, the actual number, but about what point does District 4 no longer become an effective district um, for under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And, and that has to be the topmost District 4 I was currently drawn and changes to it. So that, that's, does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Um, and, I, and I appreciate the lens at which you're looking at this, and I think you'll hear from other community members too that they're looking at this wanting to see and make sure that a community that has been historically underrepresented in politics during this redistricting process for the next decade, that we make sure that community has a seat at the table for the next yeah. decade. So and, 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 and I will add that District 4 we know has to grow, so there is some opportunity for some changes to the District 4 boundary, either as it currently stands or as Central Costa Mesa is reconfigured in any districting. Um, we do have some new development going in along Harbor Boulevard, and you talked about that. Um, how do we include those new developments that are currently in construction in this process? Yeah, so one of the things we can take into account is future population growth. So if we know that an area is going to have more growth, we can underpopulate it. Sometimes we can draw boundaries so that that growth will be divided over two or more districts um, because it's not here yet, so it doesn't have a specific community. And that may require being redrawn in 10 years from now, but those are some ways we can look at doing that. Um, now, I'll just say my word of caution is um, that some cities have one plan development, like they only had one new plan development over the course of this decade, and they expected that that district was going to be way over compared to all the other districts, and it turned out it wasn't, because there was a lot of infill development or remodeling or, you know, especially with new laws that increase the number of units that might be available on particular properties. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, 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 the future population growth, if we know that there is going to be massive development along a particular street or in a particular neighborhood, that's what that criteria is for. Um, Surprise Arizona, for example, had a district that grew 500% over the course of a decade. Um, you know, um, Beaumont, or not Beaumont, sorry, Banning. Banning had a district that grew 75% when all the other districts' population growth was between 1% and 2%. That's what future population growth is about. Um, even Whittier. Whittier has a new project coming online this decade called the Nellis Project at a site of an old, um, at an old, at an old school uh, that has, hasn't been used for a while. Um, and they're expecting to add about 1,000 new residents there. And our advice is still, um, well, a 1,000 residents isn't going to make a big difference when you consider all of these little tiny projects that are going in throughout the rest of the city. So we can take it into account. And we might want to look at that as something, reason to underpopulate districts that include that area. 
but um, we can't exceed that 10% threshold. Um, are there any significant differences between the process that was taken to do the first districting versus now? So I'm glad I have this slide up because the main difference, there's the main difference between the two processes is right here in this middle column. It used to be the case where, the, in terms of how we drew the lines, we could balance all of the criteria in the middle column and all the criteria in the far right column, um, the traditional districting principles. And that the city and its residents could decide, once you, had vo once you respected the Voting Rights Act and had equally populated districts, to what extent did you want to consider communities, compactness, contiguity, all of these other factors. Now we have a rank order. So we have to consider these criteria in the central column in this particular order. Um, it was also not prohibited when the city switched to district elections to talk about partisanship openly. And um, now it is. So those are some big differences. I would say also there are some procedural differences. For example, this hearing had to start exactly at 10 o'clock or as close to it as possible because that's in the Fair Maps Act. Um, we couldn't wait till 10 4 15 or 10 or 10 to see if people kind of wandered in. We had to start right on time. And that's true of the city council meetings as well. Those public hearings have to start at the exact time they're noticed. Um, there's also a whole bunch of reporting requirements that are new, preserving the website for 10 years and so on. Um, that really change the administrative side of the process. But um, if you're talking about the criteria, this is the big change. If you could go to slide seven. I just have a question about how the math is done, really. Um, the deviations from the ideal and the percent deviation, how is that calculated in the total? Sure. So the total deviation is the difference between the largest and the smallest districts as a percentage of the ideal population of a district. So, um, or the, from the, yeah, basically from the ideal population. So what we've done is we've added together the absolute values of ne negative or 6.46 plus 5.06 to get that total deviation. And that total percent deviation cannot be more than 10%, right? That's, that's correct. All right. That's what the court, Supreme Court has said is presumptively constitutional. Got it. I just want to end by putting up the uh, phone number, email address, and website for those of you who are still interested in finding out more and continuing to get updated on the tools. Uh, we also have a mailing list, if you haven't already signed in, where we'll send you emails once we have those updates. So thank you for coming, and we look forward to hearing from you again.